Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I've had to head security in my house. Um, I've had death threats. BC's top doctor threatened and abused over her pandemic response. Also. Casting your vote? Be like getting a takeout coffee. Unprecedented election. Day one on the campaign trail as party leaders hit the road. And. We think that it's more widespread now than was previously thought. Not spared from COVID-19, significant number of cases found on Vancouver's downtown east side. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. A startling admission from BC's provincial health officer today. Dr. Bonnie Henry says she has received death threats as she leads BC's fight against COVID-19. Our Dan Burrett joins us now live with more. So Dan, Dr. Henry now has more protection around her. She has had to have security in her own home, Leanne, part of the darker side of leading BC's pandemic response. For months now, Dr. Henry has been providing those daily updates on how many people have been infected, how many people have died, and how many cases of COVID-19 we're dealing with. Today, Henry spoke on a panel about women in leadership at the UB Union of BC Municipalities Conference. She says she has received a lot of positive feedback on her work, but admits there are many people who don't like what she does, how she says things, even her shoes. She says she thinks it's partly due to her being a woman in a high-profile position. The abuse is disturbing, and she's not the only victim. Nasty notes, to uh, leave phone calls, to harass my office staff. Um, I've had to head security in my house. Um, I've had death threats. You know, how do we deal with that? Um, and I, I sense that people find that it's, uh, it's okay to do that for a woman who's up front, more so than um, some of our male leaders. That is disturbing news, Dan. So what does Dr. Henry, and I'm sure many of us, want to see changed? She says we need to be able to be able to speak about this, at least for a start. If we're going to bring up the next generation of, of diverse and confident leaders, um, we need to be able to talk about those things. We need to be able to um, make it not okay for any of us to get that type of abuse, really. For its part, Victoria Police says it is aware of threats made against Dr. Henry during the pandemic and it does a risk assessment but can't talk about any ongoing investigations. The BCRCMP says it's tasked with protecting the Premier and internationally protected persons and notes Dr. Henry does not meet the threshold for close RCMP protection. Leanne? All right, thanks for that, Dan. Dan Burt reporting live for us tonight. Well, today marks day one of a five-week campaign trail. Our provincial election is set for October 24th. Despite being in the middle of a pandemic, all three party leaders were out today kicking off their campaigns. NDP leader John Horgan was in North Vancouver today endorsing MLA Bowen Ma in her riding and announcing 10 more urgent primary care centres will be opening across BC by the end of 2021. He also reiterated how hard it was to call the election, but again stood by his decision. We were going to continue to have the type of hectoring that will be involved over the next couple of weeks as part of an election campaign for 12 months. We won't be focusing on the things that matter to British Columbians. It's time to put the politics behind us. An election will do that. This is, this is about making sure that people have a say. It's never a bad time to ask British Columbians what they want to do, where they want to go and who they want to lead them. And that's why I called the election. Meanwhile, Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson was in Surrey with some of the party candidates running there. As one of the fastest growing municipalities in the province, he says it's being neglected by the NDP party. It's a time for complete renewal in Surrey because the Surrey MLA's ministers have really failed their community badly. Whether it's on transportation, schools, trucking, taxis, you name it, they have failed to support their community on just about every issue that's come up. And BC Green leader Sonia Furstenau was in Saanich along with fellow candidate Adam Olson. The new leader addressed rumours that the lack of green support for the spring budget was one of the reasons behind the election call. This election came down to the decision of one person and one person only and that was John Horgan. This was his decision to throw this unnecessary election in the midst of a global pandemic at a time when people are worried about their financial security, their kids, at a time when small businesses are struggling 
when we have teachers wondering about the safety of their working conditions. First now says more Green Party candidates will be confirmed in the coming days. BC has embarked on an unprecedented election in the middle of a pandemic. Our legislative affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher is live with the details. So Tanya, take us through day one of the campaign. Yeah, here we are, Leanne, in Elections BC today also outlined the logistics of how voting will look next month. And the party leaders, as you saw, have hit the campaign trail officially, but in a way we've never seen before. This is what the first full day of a pandemic election campaign looks like. Hey, Bowen. Hey, John, how's it going? Good, man. How are you? The NDP still has a bus, but unmarked outside and only about a third full inside. The B.C. Liberal leader is driving himself around on the campaign trail, and the Greens are also scaling down to a COVID-conducive campaign. At John Horgan's first official campaign event, masks are mandatory and physical distancing is in place. A handful of reporters are on site, but most call in with questions. Just a reminder to reporters on the phone line, please press star one to get in the queue. The usual hordes of media embedded with the parties and the candidates rallying the crowds at big events, noticeably absent this time, and the leaders themselves are shifting their strategies accordingly. We want to make sure that we're engaging with people, but we want to do it in a way that keeps them safe. And uh, that's going to mean a lot of time on the telephone, a lot of time in small group meetings. This is a pandemic election. It's going to be conducted in ways that we've never contemplated before. Andrew Wilkinson's answer to an unprecedented campaign, more public access to the leaders through their television screens. So we're proposing and we're challenging the other parties to have three leaders debates. As for the vote itself, Elections BC is bracing for an unprecedented number of ballots in the mail. Typically only 1% of ballots are cast by mail. This time around, it's projected to spike to 35%. Last election, a total of 6,500 people voted by mail. By 6.30 this morning, Elections BC had already received 20,000 requests for mail-in ballots. And for those planning to vote in person, there will be capacity limits, protective barriers, and and PPE for election volunteers. Most voters will likely only spend minutes inside a voting place. Casting your vote be like getting a takeout coffee or picking up milk and eggs from the grocery store. This year, there will only be one additional day of advanced voting compared to 2017, and schools, which made up nearly half of polling stations last election, will be used, but only for the general vote on Saturday, October 24th, and the weekend before for advanced voting. Okay, Tanya, much quieter campaign trail than mm -hmm. we were used to. So <laughs> given the significant number of mail-in ballots expected, so what is this going to mean for tabulating final votes? Yeah, typically the absentee ballots aren't tallied until 13 days after the general election day. So with a huge increase, as we saw in the number of mail-in ballots expected this time, it could take weeks to tabulate all of them. That means if the races in some ridings are simply too close to call on election night, it is technically possible we won't know who won for sure, well after October 24th, Leanne. All right, we will stay tuned. Thanks, Tanya. Tanya Fletcher reporting for us this evening. And if next month's election feels close to you, imagine how BC's political parties feel. They are scrambling right now to get their candidates in order before the deadline, less than two weeks from now, in a very compressed campaign schedule. Justin McElroy is here to break down the day's developments for us. So, Justin, how is this snap election changing the usual process here? Uh, it means for all of the political parties, there is a mad rush to go from a slow process they were underway for choosing their candidates in all 87 ridings to a really rushed one where vetting is rushed, voting for candidates is rushed. It all has to be done by October 2nd. So here's a board of where the parties are at right now with confirmed candidates. You can see the BC Liberal Party is in the 60s. That's because they've decided to go away with any nomination elections and are simply appointing people. The BC NDP are in the 40s and have 
dozens of choices to make over the next couple days. The Greens, just the two MLAs that they have currently, Sonia Furstenel and Adam Olson, they'll be announcing a slew of candidates over the next little bit. And the Christian Heritage Party technically on the board with one candidate. They were quick to register with Elections BC. But all of this is compressed. It means that for all of the parties, there's a lot of work to quickly get everyone in gear. And there could be some ruffled feathers along the way for people who might argue the democratic process isn't going quite as fair for everyone as possible because of how quickly parties are trying to do all of this. Okay, on that note, Justin, you know, we're only on day one, as we've noted, but we're already seeing a controversy over in Stikine with a former federal NDP MP. Has that been resolved yet? Uh, from the NDP's point of view, it's been resolved. They say that Nathan Cullen is going to be their candidate in this election. No ifs, ands, or buts. The longtime MP in the region said that he was going to be the candidate last week. The party said that nobody was able to come by the deadline other than him who was qualified. There's just one problem with that. Anita McPhee, an Indigenous leader in the area who attempted to get the NDP's federal nomination last year, said she was in interested. She put out publicly that she wanted to run for it. The party rebuffed her, said that she wasn't allowed to, even though the party has a mandate in place saying that in cases like this where it's a writing when an NDP MLA previously was male, the person who has to replace them can't be a male unless they come from an equity-seeking group. So it's a mess in a lot of ways. She says she's considering a legal challenge. We'll see if this amounts to more than just hurt feelings or something that the NDP will have to deal with throughout this campaign. All right. Thank you, Justin. And Justin, we'll be watching your tweets along the way. Thanks for that, Justin McElroy, reporting for us this evening. In announcing today's new COVID-19 numbers, Dr. Henry says now is the time to regroup and reset. As it becomes colder and wetter outside and our activities move inside, she says it's important to protect our loved ones by spending less time outside our household bubble. Her advice comes as the province reports 96 new confirmed cases of the virus, bringing the total to just over 8,300 cases in B.C., there has been a new outbreak in one unit at St. Paul's Hospital. In total, there are 12 long-term care or assisted living facilities with ongoing outbreaks. There are fortunately no new deaths to report today, and just over 6,500 people have recovered from the virus. The BC Center for Disease Control has released an updated map of COVID-19 cases by regions. The two regions that saw the highest surge in cases are just one month are Peace River North with 42 confirmed cases in August. That's a 323% increase in just one month. The second largest increase was in a local health region in Vancouver, centered around the downtown east side and adjacent neighborhoods. There were 79 cases in the area at an increase of 179%. Meanwhile, studies done on the downtown east side are showing that more people have had COVID-19 than earlier suspected. Our Tina Lovegreen now on how researchers are trying to study the impact the virus is having on that community. The Union Gospel Mission is the latest to publicly report a case of COVID-19. We don't believe anybody else has been impacted or affected in that way or infected. The individual wasn't part of their homeless community, but lived in one of their transitional housing units. UGM says it's taking all precautions necessary and wanted to share the information with the public to be completely transparent. Unfortunately, though, we do know that COVID-19 is more widespread than we know and likely more widespread than we previously thought. Numbers seem to indicate the virus is on the rise in the area, but it's hard to pin down how serious the situation is and whether the rise in cases is new or has been happening for a while. Dr. Brian Conway and his team at the Vancouver Infectious Disease Centre are trying to get to the bottom of it. The nonprofit is looking into how many people in the community have had the virus by running antibody tests of those living in shelters. So we have found a significant number of individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19 antibodies. Out of the few hundred they've tested so far, a couple dozen have the antibodies. Some didn't recall being sick, confusing their COVID-19 symptoms with those of opioid withdrawal. 
But the other problem, he says, is that resources were reduced or completely shut down during the early stages of the pandemic. However, it seems as if there were cases. We didn't diagnose them because we weren't testing in that way, especially early in the pandemic. We had a focused approach to testing that was meeting the key public health needs of the time. And now it's important, I think, for us to understand what exactly happened in this neighborhood and how we can deal with it. And he says they need to begin that work now before the flu and cold season is upon us. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. And coming up a little later, we'll bring you the latest on COVID-19 across the country with the latest modeling numbers and why officials are very concerned about the surge. Burnaby RCMP are asking for your help tonight to find the people who stole a playground slide. At some point in the last month, a slide was stolen from Suncrest Elementary School in South Burnaby. A groundskeeper noticed the slide went missing last Monday. Now kids in the neighborhood are left without one of their favorite parts of the playground. The slide itself is worth thousands of dollars. Anyone with information on the theft is asked to reach out to Burnaby RCMP or Crime Stoppers. A number of fishing industry organizations and First Nations are demanding the government do more to protect wild salmon. They say a dwindling number of fish and record low returns on the Fraser River are warning signs. Organizers say wild salmon are facing many stressors, including climate change, overfishing and habitat destruction. Chief Judy Wilson says the government needs to start removing a number of open pen net fish farms. You know, we, we call it an emergency state for COVID. It's really an emergency state for the salmon in British Columbia. The DFO emailed a statement to CBC News in response to today's press conference. They say the government is fully committed to the necessary work to reverse the trend of declining Pacific salmon stocks. And meteorologist Johanna Wagseff joins us now. Happy first day of fall, Joe, first of all. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, yes, the autumnal season is upon us. Happy first day of fall to you as well. And it's looking, you know, pretty fall-like behind you, but it was pretty sunny today. Gorgeous afternoon. Well, I have not nerded out about clouds in quite some time, but I've got to say there was some pretty spectacular asparatus undulatus just disappearing behind me, usually an indicator that a storm is coming, and that is exactly what's on the way. So hopefully... People got out and enjoyed, uh, yes, some blue sky today. Let me show you what's going on the satellite right now. The first big storm of the season literally knocking on our door. You can see showers crossing into the west coast of Vancouver Island as we speak with that sharp frontal boundary still to come. We will see winds pick up overnight tonight. And I just want to take you through the wind, uh, not only wind, but the uh, slew of warnings we have across the west coast. Everyone in orange under the special weather statement for generally wet and windy weather. Uh, up towards Howe Sound, a rainfall warning, but parts of the North Shore itself could see close to 100 millimeters. And then everyone in yellow, winds approaching 100 kilometers per hour tonight, coming in from the southeast. A quick breakdown of our next 12 hours. Uh, temperatures will be fall like, but it's really the winds and the rain that are the big story. By tomorrow morning, uh, expect heavy rainfall that will continue through most of the day. I will time it out because this is not our first storm this week. We've got four coming, details coming up. Oh my, okay, we will check in with you in a little bit. Thanks, Joe. The Vancouver Symphony Orchestra has raised the curtain on their fall plans for concerts amid COVID-19. And we have um, very strict protocol in place with mask wearing, and we have, um, of course, uh, plexiglass barriers between sections in particular. Now, even with those safety practices implemented, there won't be events with live audiences. Instead, concerts will be filmed at the Orpheum and released online. Events will feature the classical repertoire, but also programs for kids and families and pop-up events. The season opens October 16th, and digital subscriptions will be made available. And a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on our app, CBC Gem. That free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. That's where you can find me and Johanna and follow us there as well. A grim model showing COVID-19 cases in Canada on the rise. So what might happen next? The pan-Canadian picture. That's coming up.
and thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. The restrictions imposed by the pandemic have forced Canadians to learn many new hobbies. We know activities such as baking and biking have gone up over the summer and so has fishing which is luring many Albertans big and small to take in the outdoors. Travis McEwen has that story from Edmonton. Deborah Anderson and her daughter Emma are almost at one of their favorite fishing spots along the shore of the North Saskatchewan River in Edmonton. This has almost been a daily activity for Anderson this summer. It's therapeutic for handling pandemic-related stress. One, two, three. <laughs> Fishing allows you to escape that and just have your own peace of mind. It lets you self-reflect on things. It's a stress reliever. Good guy. But her daughter may be more entertained by the worms they use for bait. For these two, fishing is a natural fit for COVID-19 restrictions. It's easy to social distance when you're fishing. I don't want anyone within 10 feet of me when I'm fishing personally, because you never know if a hooks might get them and it's going to hurt. For new fishers, it can be frustrating to not catch a fish all summer, but still fun. It's enjoyable. It's relaxing. It's, it gets you out of the house and away from the TV that you're constantly sitting in front of. If it seems like you've seen a lot of people casting at spots like this over the summer, well, provincial statistics support that. 250,000 fishing licenses have been sold in Alberta this year. According to Alberta Environment and Parks, 37,000 of those are new customers. Here's what some of the other provinces reported to CBC News. Alberta has seen one of the largest increases in fishing license sales, a 30% increase when compared to last year. That trend has been noticed in fishing stores as well, at this Edmonton location of the fishing hole, close to 30% of its customers are new to the outdoor activity. We're finding that we're obviously with the new begin, new fishermen, uh, we're having to explain a lot of uh, things to them, and, and uh, which makes them you know learn better as well. So you know it's been good win-win uh, for everybody because uh, uh, we're not only seeing these new uh, fishermen, but hopefully with their experience in our stores. We'll come back again. As temperatures drop, it remains to be seen if new fishers will be hooked and give ice fishing a shot in the winter, or if the trend will fall off as the season changes. Travis McEwen, CBC News, Edmonton. All right, yes, lots of new hobbies being picked up uh, because of COVID-19. I, baking has not been on my list, nor has fishing, unfortunately. But, all right, we are going to be back very shortly, and we are going to have an update on the numbers across the country, seeing a surge, and the Prime Minister is going to be talking about it uh, tomorrow. So uh, some national attention being given to the issue, as we already have been for the last couple of months. Stay with us. We'll be right back. From talk of an uptick in cases to talk of a wave, whatever you want to call the COVID-19 situation in Canada right now, it's gone from calm to dicey to dangerous fast. From the lowest level of the summer, the average daily rate of new cases doubled over two months, and then it doubled again in just over two weeks. Now the country is seeing an average of more than 1,000 new cases a day, and if infections stay on this path, the reported spread of COVID-19 will be worse than it's ever been in a matter of days. The Public Health Agency of Canada has released new modeling showing how real that possibility is, saying we are at a crossroads. But as Christine Burak shows us, modeling isn't destiny. Canada got here because of people's choices, and those choices could still push COVID-19 back. It's not unexpected. Maybe most people don't want to admit it, but COVID fatigue has set in. Because I live in an apartment, so I don't have guests, but I definitely do go out more now. Ever since like everyone started easing off, like I'm not gonna, like my parents also started easing off on me, so I didn't take it as serious as I should have been, I guess. And that's the message from Canada's top public health officials. Given what we've just seen in the numbers, we have to act now. 
in, in, in those big jurisdictions, those urban areas uh, right now. New projections show on our current track, the country could hit 5,000 cases a day by the end of October. But if contacts and gatherings are reduced, Canadians can once again flatten the curve. I don't see any evidence that we're making changes now, to be perfectly frank. Instead, bubbles are growing. They now include entire classrooms full of kids, restaurants and workplaces have reopened, and private gatherings have proven tough to police. I don't think people are going to easily go back to control measures again unless it is you know, thrust upon them. Health authorities insist targeted lockdowns could happen at some point, but disease trackers say this virus could get out of control fast, triggering a wave of infections much bigger than the first. The fact that we're already on that trajectory tells me that the likelihood of this being just a small blip that we're not going to notice and we can carry on uh, is, is pretty low. The current surge in cases is already prompting an uptick in hospitalizations that will lead to more deaths. Yeah, like a few grandparents. And a then. fact not lost on some young Canadians who make up the bulk of new cases. Since the cases are rising up again, like I'm sort of a little scared again. Experts insist Canadians know what they should be doing and the time to act is now. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Today, Ontario Premier Doug Ford rolled out the first step of the province's strategy to stop the surging spread of COVID-19. It comes as health officials reported 478 new cases. That's the highest we've seen in Ontario since early May. And as Lorenda Redekop explains, critics argue Ontario needs Ford's full plan now before it's too late. The first part of the government's action plan on COVID-19 for fall, urging people to get the flu shot. It is so, so critical. Uh, never before has the flu shots been so critical. Uh, someone has a runny nose or maybe your kids have a runny nose and right away it's going to backlog the, the system again. The government says it's ordering 5.1 million doses, the first available later this month. It comes following another increase in cases of COVID-19. Today, Toronto recorded the highest number of new cases with 153. Peel had 95 and there were 90 in Ottawa. The number of people in hospital is up to 82 compared to 65 a day earlier. 24 of them are in the ICU, 11 on a ventilator. It's still much lower than the hospitalizations we saw in spring. On Twitter, some doctors and infectious disease experts criticized the government, saying it has no plan and that more flu vaccines aren't what are most important right now. So already uh, this is, you know, too late um, that action is being taken. And it was extremely disappointing to see that this was the sole announcement. If we lay it all down at once, the message isn't going to get out to the people. Frankly, this doctor says the government will have to take more drastic action. Unlike when cases rose in spring, this time the economy is open. The population unfortunately has shown that vigilance and fear sort of had a limited shelf life and are no longer persisting into the fall. It's going to require closing the banquet halls, closing the indoor dining, things that people are saying and have been saying so that we can keep schools running and we can keep other essential services running in society. The opposition repeatedly called for more action on long-term care homes, extra staffing and resources. Experts provided a blueprint for exactly that kind of action months ago. Why has the Premier failed to act? The province says 99% of homes don't have outbreaks. As for the rest of the fall plan, the government says that'll be released over six days. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. The halls of power are hardly safe from coronavirus. And as Catherine Cullen explains, the issue of COVID tests isn't safe from politics either. As those droves of Canadians wait to find out if they have COVID, Morning. today this Conservative made a surprising revelation. 28 MPs had tried a test that gave a result in minutes. We had an unapproved test that's waiting uh, for approval from Health Canada. His point was meant to be political. We need to see the government take action and speed up the process to approve these tests. But how and why were Conservatives using an unapproved test? There was a, uh, a business in one of the uh, ridings that was giving a demonstration to the Ontario caucus. 
A spokesperson for the Conservatives added that as part of the presentation, MPs who were interested in trying the test were invited to do so. Without naming the test, she said it had already been approved by the U.S. FDA and in Europe. She also revealed it was a serological test, not a test of whether someone has COVID right now. It's not an immediate test, it's a background test, but it's, it was reassuring. The Conservatives have really shot their credibility. The NDP leader accuses Conservatives of politicizing what he says should be a question of science. They used that testing device that had not received clearance from our Canadian approval process and then are bragging that they use this, this service or this, this, this testing. That to me is, is completely unbelievable. There was no bragging involved. It was a, an observation of a test that's in use in other countries. The Liberals are defending the wait for new tests, saying that Health Canada is doing its work carefully to ensure that any new test gives accurate results. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, as Canada tries to head off a second wave, our neighbours to the south passed a grim milestone today. 20,000 flags were put out on the National Mall to represent the more than 200,000 who have died in the United States due to the pandemic. The U.S. death toll is the highest number of deaths in the world by far. Brazil is in second place with over 137,000 dead, followed by India with almost 89,000. And tougher COVID-19 restrictions are coming into force in Britain. The UK has seen more pandemic deaths than anywhere else in Europe. As CBC's Renee Filipponi tells us, the new rules are aimed at countering a worrying surge in new cases. So we do on Thursday, you can't say last order is around 9 30, 9 45. A message of change being delivered across England today here to bar staff about new closing times and driven home by the Prime Minister in a national address. These risks are not our own. The tragic reality of having COVID is that your mild cough can be someone else's death knell. Masks will now be mandatory in more places and people are being urged to work from home again after months of being told to go back to the office. I can work from home and I think we should if it means that the infection rate stays low. I do think there's been a certain amount of <laughs> a lack of clarity. I think it's frustrating for everyone. Pubs and restaurants must close by 10 p.m. in an effort to prevent risky behavior from drinkers. We're definitely going to have, you know, this owner says the industry is being unfairly targeted. We'll probably be taken out by this. You know, we haven't done anything wrong. They just go elsewhere, which the government must have realized by now. They can have parties in their own homes that aren't supervised. Earlier in the House of Commons, Boris Johnson said new fines will be handed out and that the military has been offered to help police. There is nothing more frustrating for the vast majority who do comply, the law-abiding majority, than the sight of a few brazenly defying the rules. And it's likely things will stay like this for a while. The government says people should assume these new changes will be in place for six months. And if the infection rate doesn't drop, new restrictions could be on the way. The hope is to prevent a return to this, a near total lockdown in the spring, which brought the economy crashing to a halt. But some worry the moves today you, don't Mr. go Speaker. far enough. The second national lockdown is not inevitable. That would be a, few, a huge failure of government, not an act of God. There is still time to prevent it. And for now, shutting down the virus will mean closing time on parts of social life. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. It's a throne speech in a time of COVID. A preview of what the Governor General might have to say. That's next. It was a startling sight, almost breathtaking. Haida sculptor Bill Reed's magnificent war canoe, the Lutas, splitting the heart of Paris and France's famous River Seine, past some of the most well-known landmarks in the world. For five days, the Lutas has been traveling up the torturous bends of the Seine, on its way, among other things, 
to fulfill a dream Bill Reed once had, to watch his war canoe pass under the oldest bridge in Paris, the Pont Neuf. Now 69, suffering from Parkinson's disease, only moments away from the final leg of the trip, Bill Reed wasn't about to let anything uh, stop him. It's a dream we're all living in. Uh, it's dream. hard, hard to, uh, to uh, put exact words to describe a dream. <laughs> in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower, the Haida took pictures and prepared for the last few kilometers, which would take them to the center of Paris, City Hall. Bill Reed was given the best seat in the boat, and off they went. The Lutas is in Paris to take center stage at a huge exhibition at the Museum of Man. More than 30 works by Bill Reed will be on display, the first time the museum has featured a living artist. When the museum expressed interest in the canoe, Reed said, the paddlers go with the canoe. It's a living piece of art, not a dead one. The museum said, okay. And so incredibly, Bill Reed got his wish. His canoe passed smoothly beneath the historical Pont Neuf. After docking along the riverside, the Haida were ushered in to one of the grandest buildings in Paris, the centuries-old Hotel de Ville, or City Hall. There, they met the mayor of Paris, Jacques Chirac. It's a great pleasure, sir, to have you today and to meet you. It's a great, great pleasure. Before the Haida pushed off for the canoe's final resting place downstream, they had talked about their enormous sense of pride and accomplishment bringing their culture into the heart of one of the world's oldest and greatest cities. Rod Mickleborough, CBC News, Paris. A Canadian daredevil pulled off quite a stunt in China. He took a walk between a couple of skyscrapers 120 meters up. Jay Cochran did it without a safety harness and without a net. With a crowd of thousands holding its breath below, he made the trip across the tightrope in just 15 minutes. Cochran, who is 52, grew up in North Bay and Sudbury before he left home to join the circus at age 14. His latest stunt was part of the Shanghai Tourism Festival. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We need to be able to talk about those things. We need to be able to um, make it not okay for any of us to get that type of abuse, really. Dr. Bonnie Henry says she has been harassed and received death threats during the COVID-19 pandemic. The province's chief health officer says she has had to have security at her home. She believes it could partially be due to the fact that she's a woman in a leadership position. If there are a significant amount of uh, absentee ballots, including vote by mail ballots, uh, the preparation time uh, before final count may take longer. Elections BC is bracing for mass votes by mail. More than a third of votes are expected to be mailed in. Final election results could take two weeks to be tallied. COVID-19 did not miss the inner city. There are a certain number of individuals that became infected. New case numbers and antibody testing now show more people living on the downtown east side have been infected with COVID-19 than previously thought. It comes as a new case is being reported at the Union Gospel Mission. Well, tomorrow is a big day for the Liberal government. The speech from the throne will lay out plans for fighting the pandemic and getting the country back on track. And as David Cochran tells us, the Prime Minister is adding something extra. There have been agreements and differences. The Governor General reads the speech from the throne, but unlike years past, Julie Payette will not have the last word. Sources tell CBC News Justin Trudeau intends to address the nation tomorrow night, asking TV networks for airtime. With Payette mired in controversy and under investigation, with the country in a health and economic crisis, the Prime Minister is keen to be the prime messenger for his COVID recovery plan. 
The speech will focus on three broad themes. Healthcare spending to control the spread of COVID-19, continuing financial support for Canadians and businesses struggling through the pandemic, and economic rebuilding with an acute focus on green investments. We put forward our two demands. But it's a minority parliament and the opposition has demands. Extend CERB, put in place a new program that doesn't cut the help they receive, and make sure every Canadian has access to paid sick leave. That's what we're asking for. Sources say measures along those lines will be in there along with money for long-term care to address the failures that led to the vast majority of COVID deaths in Canada. There's also money for child care to ensure more parents, especially women, can go back to work. So today is about a vision. It's about a vision for our country, and economic measures to create more announcements like this, the refit of Ford auto plants in Ontario to make electric cars and batteries. This is a government that's looking to invest in green technology. This is a government. Mostly the speech will have an urgent focus on the health crisis of the moment, with Trudeau bracing Canadians for the long haul, reminding that as cases spike and testing lines grow, life without COVID is a long way off. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And CBC News will have the Prime Minister's address at 3.30 Pacific time tomorrow afternoon on CBC Television as well as online on our free app, GEM. We'll also have full analysis right after the address. As countries face the threat of a global pandemic and climate change, many world leaders at this year's UN General Assembly are looking for cooperation and commitment. But as Stephen D'Souza tells us, the U.S. president used his virtual speech today to promote American nationalism while taking aim at China. The fourth plenary meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. Addressing a near empty General Assembly hall, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres painted a stark picture of a world brought to its knees by the coronavirus. COVID-19 has laid bare the world's fragilities, rising inequalities, climate catastrophe, widening social societal divisions, rampant corruption. He was one of the few to speak in person. Because of the pandemic, any world leader coming to New York would have had to quarantine for 14 days, effectively keeping them at home. On the organization's 75th anniversary, Guterres said world cooperation to battle the pandemic was more important than ever. And we must be united. We have seen when countries go in their own direction, the virus goes in every direction. While not mentioning him by name, that message may have well been squarely aimed at U.S. President Donald Trump. I am proudly putting America first, just as you should be putting your countries first. That's okay. That's what you should be doing. Trump delivered a brief, concentrated version of his usual campaign speeches and again attacked China for its handling of the coronavirus. We must hold accountable the nation which unleashed this plague onto the world, China. China's Xi Jinping used his speech to take a number of veiled shots at Trump on everything from trade to how the U.S. has handled the pandemic. We should see each other as members of the same big family, pursue win-win cooperation and rise above ideological disputes and not fall into the trap of clash of civilizations. Xi's speech comes as China pushes to assert itself at the U.N. That's presented a challenge for countries like Canada. I think we have to join with a number of other countries in, in trying to make sure that the UN stays true to its, its multilateral mission. In the wake of the climate crisis and COVID, it's a mission a number of leaders today described as one of the biggest challenges the United Nations has ever faced. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. The frantic effort to save beached whales in Australia and also the rush to understand why. And it is 6.42 p.m. There's your live look at Prince Edward Island on a very wet and windy night. The Atlantic being hammered by the outer rings of post-tropical storm Teddy. We'll take you there next. This is a rock, is it living or non-living? Non. non. Grade one students sit on tree stumps instead of desks. A whiteboard leans against a tree. They learn about science by finding slugs and rocks. 
slug is it living or non-living? Living. A leaf is that living? Nearby, a math lesson, okay, figuring out the length of different mushrooms. Hey, what about this one? Oh, Tell me. Seven, 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 seven or eight. Hidden Valley Elementary had already been trying to do some outdoor learning, but wanted to start this year with a lot more. We knew it was going to be the safest spot with COVID, right? So we knew that that was, that was a big influence for us to, to decide to do this model this year on getting outside. Um, but it didn't make any of it easier because we had to do COVID planning for inside and outside of the building and make sure that all of that was taken care of, knowing that we were going to use both the both the physical school itself and the outside piece. And so it didn't make anything easier, but it made us feel better. Hidden Valley is a public school and they cover the regular curriculum, just with more of it outside. Parents donated tree stumps for the classrooms. There are tarp shelters if it rains and a fire pit if kids are cold. But for the most part, our classes are probably outside on average um, two plus hours a day, right? Um, some of our classes are outside almost exclusively. Can you find the seeds? Look at I'm bloody. Is it like Over with the grade twos and threes, it's free time. And James Mitchell's okay. students brought him a mud cake. It looks delicious. Yeah, firewood. Firewood is the best ingredient. So right now a lot of them are really interested in berries. So, so I'll take note of that and I'll see all the different ways that I can pull berries into the curriculum, whether it be math or socials. A dairy for yeah. real life to eat. <laughs> Kaden, it's pretty good. <laughs> These kids haven't been in school for a really long time, so it's nice to give them space. James is one of a few teachers here trained in this style of teaching. It's called forest school. It's all about playing outdoors, and it's gaining popularity around the country. When you bring them out of the four walls, it's, it's amazing to see the difference. Um, the freedom that they experience, I find you get them kind of the, their raw self. I believe everyone is, is a better version of themselves when they're outdoors. But teaching in the forest comes with unique challenges, and teachers need more than a whiteboard and red pen. I have my bear spray, we have radios to stay in touch. We have a whistle, so all the students are trained that if I blow this three times, they know it's, uh, it's some sort of drastic emergency, they'll, they'll come in. Um, we have a first aid kit. I have a lighter, lighter. we were learning uh, fire starting today. Um, I have a whiteboard, some on the fly teaching. Uh, some ex extra face masks and gloves. But with COVID-19, there's another reason to get outside. It's nice to educate them and teach them about what COVID is and how we can, how we can protect ourselves from it. And it's nice to have them on the land where, where we know there's not as high risk of germs and like bacteria transferring on, on objects. As the weather gets colder, they'll spend more time inside. But the principal said in past years, they've sometimes been out in negative 30. Laura Howell, CBC News, Whitehorse. When your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Once a hurricane, Teddy, now a post-tropical storm is picking up speed as it takes aim at Atlantic Canada. Official, officials in Nova Scotia are telling people to stay away from the eastern coastline because of a storm surge. Over the last number of years, uh, uh, we've lost a lot of people who have gone to the coastline to watch those waves. And that's what we need to avoid in this particular storm especially. Waves are forecast to reach as high as 10 meters. Teddy is expected to make landfall in Nova Scotia tomorrow morning and parts of Newfoundland and Labrador tomorrow night. High winds and heavy rain warnings are in effect for the area. And Joe joins us live again. So Joe, you've been tracking this storm very closely. What's the latest over there? Oh, Leanne, this storm center, even though it's post-tropical, uh, is still packing winds of 140 kilometers per hour about 300 kilometers south of Halifax. And as you mentioned, landfall tomorrow morning east of Halifax 
is still expected to uh, bring pretty big impacts. I want to show you what it looks like on the satellite. You can see as it's gone from this closed circulation hurricane to more of a comet shape. Really, it's just no longer gaining its strength from warm waters. It's gaining its strength from temperature differences. So looking to see those big winds and rain and storm surge line up with high tide tonight. Again, the center of Teddy making landfall east of Halifax tomorrow around 10 a.m. local time. So it's really been a one-two punch of a storm. And I'll be watching that one closely uh, through the next 12 hours. I also want to show you some pictures coming out of Texas. Speaking of tropical cyclones, another landfall in the past 24 hours, this time with Tropical Storm Beta moving onshore in Texas, bringing widespread flooding after it circulated just offshore for a few days. Beta is the ninth storm to make landfall in the U.S. so far this season, and it's likely we will see another landfalling storm before the season ends end of November. This would make it the top season ever on record for a number of landfalling storms, so I will be watching things closely. Luckily, nothing expected to heat up in the Atlantic over the next five days. Uh, watching our own landfalling storms of a different nature over the next couple of days, you can see uh, this approaching system spreading rain across the island as we speak is what will be bringing us the heavy rain tomorrow morning. Really starting pre-dawn for Metro Vancouver, I'm thinking around 3 a.m. is when we'll start to get into the heavier rain. Pausing you at 10 a.m., you can see those yellows in the forecast model. That's the heavy rain. And we will see quite a difference between uh, those of you in the north. Uh, north Shore, you could be getting over 100 millimeters by the end of the day. Maybe even looking at some breaks in the rain if you're watching from a Delta, Richmond, uh, Tawasin, usual rain shadow suspects. So quite varied in the rainfall accumulation maps. Uh, those getting close to the reds and whites, that's where we might see localized flooding. Possibly some power outages. Uh, with winds tonight and tomorrow morning gusting upwards of 90 kilometers per hour for the coast sections. For Metro Vancouver, I think that's more like a 50 to 60 kilometer per hour story, but definitely a wet one right across the south coast. And as I mentioned earlier, those wind warnings still in place for parts of the island, uh, the Sunshine Coast and Haida Gwaii. So let me take you through the next five days beca because we do have a number of different systems to track through. Again, wet through most of your Wednesday. The stormiest time of the day will be in the morning. Afternoon, we'll see the winds begin to ease and the steadier rain taper off. As we head into Thursday, another pulse of rain expected through the morning hours. And look at these temperatures, very fall-like indeed, actually coming down to a 13 or a 14 for Friday. Uh, Friday looks to see, it looks to bring another pulse of rain. At this point, the final pulse, uh, some discrepancy in the model, shifting it back and forth between Saturday and Sunday, I know. The all-important weekend forecast, our first full fall weekend. Uh, right now, it looks like Saturday is the drier of the two days with that uh, fourth storm hitting on Sunday. But again, earlier models had it reversed, so I will watch that closely as we head into the end of the week. Either way, storm number one set to arrive overnight tonight. This will look very different this time tomorrow. All right, we will have our umbrellas and wellies ready. Thank you for that, Joe. The Supreme Court has started two days of hearings on the federal carbon tax. It's deciding if Ottawa has the right to impose a price on pollution on the provinces. The environment is not covered in the Constitution. Today, justices asked lawyers from Saskatchewan and Ontario how Canada can help stop climate change if any single province chooses not to help. The two provinces and Alberta say the provinces have jurisdiction over the environment. And rescuers in Australia believe about 100 of the approximately 300 whales found stranded on a beach have died. But they've managed to save more than two dozen and they are hopeful more will be okay. This is such a tricky event, such a, a complex event, that any way we save, we're considering a, a real win. Um, so we're focusing on, on uh, you know, having as many survivors as we can. The pilot whales were discovered Monday on a beach and two sandbars on the island of Tasmania. Authorities aren't sure why they became stranded. More than 65 state park workers, fishermen and volunteers are part of the rescue effort. This linebacker is set to try out for Canada's best junior football team. Why she's raising eyebrows both on and off the field. Next.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Gloria Makarenko for a special edition of the Splash Art Auction and Gala. Get your tickets and help support Arts Umbrella programming. Learn more at artsumbrella.com. And don't miss the Mothers Matter Center's 20th anniversary celebration on October 21st. Celebrate courageous Canadian mothers who have overcome unique educational, linguistic and cultural barriers. Get your tickets at mothersmattercenter.ca. Football, football fans can probably attest it's been pretty quiet during the pandemic here in Canada. But a team in Saskatoon is using the time away from the gridiron to break a 99-year-old tradition and introduce a new player. Fiona Odlum has the story. Honestly, just feel like I'm living a movie or a dream or something because I just, yeah, it's weird to think that it's actually me that it's happening to. <laughs> just thought I was going to keep playing women's football. It wasn't really on my radar at all. Emma Raydale is making history. The standout Western Women's Canadian Football League linebacker has earned a shot to play with the top junior men's team in Canada. Well, I think tend to underestimate like the speed and strength that women do have. Like I, I wouldn't be where I am without, you know, the elite program that is the Valkyries and the WWCFL. You know, it's not just a nothing league of you know, average athletes. The 22 year old who stands at five foot six has a physicality and athleticism that helped the Valkyries win two championships in 2016 and 2019. This caught the eye of the Saskatoon Hilltops coaching staff and they offered her a spot on the team, making Dale the first woman to suit up for a Canadian Junior Football League team ever. So when the idea was first kind of brought forward I definitely was pretty shell-shocked and took it as a huge compliment for sure and it's not anything I'm taking lightly at all. Winners of six straight national titles the Hilltops are the most dominant team in junior football. They say this isn't a gimmick or about breaking gender barriers on the gridiron. It's all about making plays and you know at the end of the day Hilltop football is all about winning so that's what we're looking for and we know she's a winner and so as I said it was a real easy decision to you know, get her on this team and now, now it's just a matter of, you know, seeing exactly where she fits in and, and how she competes. The pandemic has put a stop to games in 2020, but the Hilltops are on the field preparing for 2021. Dale says the transition to playing with men has already helped improve her game. You just kind of have to always make sure that you're diving into the physical aspect of things because you have to sort of assert yourself on the field as a linebacker and hold your ground. So that's kind of been I think one adjustment is that you just you can't you can't ever back off. Dale knows stepping out onto the field and donning the Hilltops jersey will show the value women bring to sports and that the next generation of young girls are watching. Fiona Odlum, CBC News, Saskatchewan. She is a great role model. I don't know a lot about football, as many of my colleagues here could probably tell you, but you know what? I support any woman that is breaking boundaries that way. Emma Ray, we salute you. Great work. Good luck. We will be watching for more wonderful stories from you. All right, that does it for us tonight. You can always find more of our news online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local newscast is right here at 11 o'clock after the National with Dan Burt, and I will see you back here tomorrow. Have a good night.